Good afternoon, everyone. While we're all currently in different locations, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we each live and work. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to any First Nations people who may be joining us today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. I'm Ruth Gormley. I lead the strategic marketing team at Creative Victoria and manage the Creative Exchange Arts Hub partnership that today's webinar is part of. My preferred pronouns are she and her. Our sector has been horribly impacted by COVID. It was among the first to shut down and will be one of the last to come out, which makes thinking about what we want the sector's future to look like even more urgent. In Victoria, we are very proud of the quality, tenacity and audacity of our creative community, even though they're hurting. We are proud of our strategic approach to the creative industries and our cultural infrastructure. As we approach the launch of a new creative state strategy for 2021 to 25, we're thinking about the situation we find ourselves in right now, Victoria's vision of what the sector could be in 2025 and how to get there from here. For today, I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Kate Fielding, CEO of A New Approach, about a cohesive nationwide vision for our sector's future, firmly grounded in the demonstrated importance of the creative industries to our lives, our society and our culture. We intend this session to be part of an ongoing conversation between the creative sector, creatives, consumers and governments, investors, business, philanthropists and the general public. I hope you find it invigorating and enlightening. On the housekeeping front, this webinar is being live captioned. If you'd like to access the captioning, just select show captions from your Zoom menu. We're also recording this session, so any questions you ask will be on record. The recorded webinar will be available through the Creative Exchange page on the Creative Victoria website and on our top. We'll be sending out a survey following the webinar, so please fill that in and let us know how we've gone and what you'd like to see in the future. I'll now pass over to George Dunford from Arts Hub, who will be moderating today's discussion. George. Thanks, Ruth, um, and welcome to our webinar, Preparing for a National Arts, Culture and Creativity Plan. Uh, I'm George Dunford, Con Content Director at Arts Hub and Screen Hub, and my preferred pronouns are he, him. Um, as Ruth said, today we're looking at a very big question, uh, a plan for the arts based on collaboration across the sector at state, local and federal levels. Um, our guest today is Kate Fielding, the CEO of A New Approach, uh, a think tank that's leading this conversation and looking at other models for create, uh, that have created national plans for 2030 already. Just before we jump in though, um, I'd just like to give you a few tips if you're thinking of joining the conversation. If you've got any questions for us, you can put them in the Q&A function and we'll endeavour to get to as many of them as we can. Um, but if you'd like to chat about us on social media too, you can jump into the Recovery Roadmaps webinars hashtag, which is hashtag Recovery Roadmap webinars. Um, but look, perhaps it's time we heard from Kate, who joins us from uh, Noongar country over in Perth. Um, hello, Kate. Perhaps you'd like to open with telling us a little bit about the plan and about a new approach. Thanks so much, George. And yes, I do join you today from Noongar country. And I'd like to, of course, uh, recognise uh, that we are all meeting across the country on many different lands and also that across the country many of us are facing many different circumstances uh, as we travel through the uh, global pandemic. I really appreciate uh, people taking the time today uh, to gather together and I'm really hoping that we can um, get to some of those really good questions today. I am joined today of course uh, by my colleagues at A New Approach, I'd like to say Hi to Alex and Meg and Jody, uh, and really say hello to everyone right across the country. Thank you. I am going to take us through a slideshow uh, and we'll share that now, um, but we will have time for a bit of discussion at the end. So um, bear with me while we get that up. And you may be aware we have uh, a cohort of 10 philanthropic backers from right across the country. We are independent, which means that we are independent of government um, and certainly that support from those philanthropic partners is key to that independence. I will say that one of the really um, exciting things about that independence means that we can work in a non-partisan way, which means that we can work across political lines and across levels of government. It also means that we are independent of the sector. And while that is um, at times tricky, I'm sure, um, for us and for other people, 
it means that we can be a voice to talk in this space and about this space that is able to take a, a slightly uncaptured approach to some of the some of the really tricky issues in this space. And we all know that this is an area where there's real opportunity for a more cohesive policy approach, a bipartisan or nonpartisan approach. And part of our role is, has been set up to try and find a pathway to that point. Now, I'm going to very quickly show you, flash you up some photos of our board, flash you up some photos of our reference group. You're probably familiar with some of those people. But really, we're here today to talk about the idea of a national arts, culture and, and creativity plan. Now, big, important, in red point, this is a possibility, not a certainty. So when we um, are talking today, it is a, it, we're talking about a possibility, something that's not yet been committed to, that's not underway, and it's a development that would most likely be led by the federal government. I want to be really clear about where we're at in this process. So why are we talking about it now? We have seen, of course, as been said in the opening comments here, a massive disruption in this space that's uh, not uh, unique to our um, space. There is, of course, massive disruption happening as a result of COVID-19 pandemic right across the world, but we know that this space is one that has been disproportionately affected. There are changes already happening. There are changes that were already happening before this moment, but they've definitely been accelerated by this global pandemic. Given that we are facing that massive disruption, it is, there's already change happening. It's a good time to think about how we want to shape that change and, and proactively engage with it rather than it just happening. We also know that there's the parliamentary inquiry, which has been happening. That's the parliamentary inquiry into cultural and creative industries and institutions. That will be, will be believed, reporting soon. Okay, so because we have that parliamentary inquiry that's just happened, we know that there's been a number of different intel gathering processes that have been happening. So we've got current information about what's happening in this space. So of course, there's the reimagine process that happened at a national level with the Australia Council. I know that many states and territories have also been collecting current information, tracking the impact of COVID-19. We've got a whole range of different information that we can use to inform this and as we go forward. So a national arts, culture and creativity plan may be a recommendation out of the parliamentary inquiry into the cultural and creative industries and institutions. And we've been, the new approach has been really uh, putting this forward as a practical way for the federal government to facilitate more coherent and effective private and public investments across this space. We think that there's, a, there's an opportunity to get more coherent policy settings between the levels of government as that will also give a level of comfort to all those different types of private investors, including individuals, creative individuals who invest their time and their money into this space. So some of you may have had a chance to read Imagining 2030. This is a piece that we have done that really outlines why, what this could look like. We've taken a look at some existing national plans for different areas, analysed what is in them and analysed the process. And what's really clear from that is, not surprising, involving stakeholders is key. That's taking a broad approach to stakeholders is really important. So those successful national plans that we've seen, the ones that have gotten good support, that have got good buy-in, are those that don't just look specifically at a sector or specifically at an industry, that they look more broadly at governments, businesses, philanthropy, industry representatives, peak bodies, and the role that uh, those themes play in the, in the lives of the general public. That's really key to have that broad approach to this space. And certainly what we're trying to do with that analysis paper is put some ideas forward to help those stakeholders get a running start. So if you have had a chance to read it, you'll know that it proposes a development process for the plan, that it's informed by those 2030 plans I just mentioned, the agriculture, sport, innovation, tourism and defence technology plans. 
and that it outlines common elements and shows what how they could apply to a national arts, culture and creativity plan. Those elements include bold vision, an understanding of the current context, a demonstration of what the future would look like with or without a successful plan, a successful process of thinking about the future and planning with intent for it, a framework showing how stakeholders of a plan will work together, themes and focal areas to be addressed, and a framework for how success can be measured. This is, I guess, um, none of these are surprises, none of these are unusual things that you would address in a plan. But what we're trying to make really clear is that it's just, this is going to be a, a process that will both help us understand the current situation and think about what the future could be and what, where we might want to focus priority. The, I'm pull, I've popped in here for reference for us today the Sports 2030 Plan on the Plage, because it, it can be a little hard to kind of get what this could actually look like. Now, this is one I've said there, this is one page from an 80 page document. This is, this is not the entirety of the Sports 2030 Plan, but it gives you a really good overview of what, that, what this can look like. Now, I want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that there is uh, no, um, specific sport form that is described here, that this is talking about priorities and outcomes and relevance to the Australian people rather than what is specifically going to happen for table tennis. And I think that's a really important thing uh, for the sector to be thinking about as we approach this possible, possible plan, to think about, of course, and very rightly so, uh, different bodies, different people will think about the um, what it means for their art form or their practice or their place and that's that's fair and valid but we also need to think about these bigger picture things we need to think about what kind of outcomes we might want we need to think about what kind of outcomes other stakeholders might want what governments might want what the Australian public might want what their priorities might be We've proposed a few questions that may help uh, with thinking through, approaching this process and thinking through, uh, and I've, I've popped them in there. They're also, of course, in the report. So thinking about what relevance, significant, relevance and significance mean, thinking about what you think the purpose of government funding is, thinking about how a plan should reflect the change, changing and changed demographic makeup of Australia, and certainly with the release of the intergenerational report yesterday, um, there's a whole new set of um, interesting things in that, um, really great um, and some fairly challenging things. And finally, what asking yourself what you think would help create that future of Australia celebrating, benefiting from and investing in arts, culture and creativity. So we're going to have some time to talk now. I've popped the website up there for you. Um, absolutely go download this report. Please go and download um, some of those other reports that can help inform some of that thinking. And let's get stuck into a bit of a conversation. Great. Thanks, Kate. That's, that was really interesting, a great overview of, you know, what is a huge undertaking. Um, I know from reading the report that there's a few different 2030 plans that you've styled these on and there's, there's lots of commonality across them, including the ability to look at um, evaluation and the collaboration between all three um, levels of government. So I think some people have reacted to the report and gone, ah, you're, you're basing it on sport or agriculture or something like that. But there's, there's quite a few reports that you, you're working uh, across there. Um, I'm wondering if you give us a sense of the successfulness of those reports, you know, and how they've been um, in terms of their implementation. Absolutely. So there's two things that I would say about that. One is drawn from the uh, Sports 2030 experience. And I know that sometimes, as, as you've alluded there, people find the idea of talking about sports slightly challenging. I think that uh, it's a really great model, though, um, because we know that there are some, well, there are many differences and, and I'm not arguing with that. There's also some commonalities. Um, so there are really broad um, participation, 
there's really important relevance to people in their daily lives, but also that kind of aspiration for, for really high performance. There, so there's kind of a public and, public and private benefit in there. Um, there's some really interesting things. But in terms of how that has how that worked, what the benefit of that has been in implementation, one of the really interesting comments that we heard about what it's meant for that sector to have that plan is that it's brought um, the com it's brought the sector together around a much clearer understanding of those benefits and outcomes, and they've become much more effective at working together. Um, including in their work with government, rather than being kind of table tennis is very different to other types of tennis and badminton is a different thing altogether um, and, you, you know, working in a very fragmented way, um, it's meant that they've, people were willing to go, yes, we all have different focus and needs and all of those things, but there are things that we do agree on, there are things that we can work together on and there's things that we can prioritise together and be more effective. Um, so I think that's a really um, use. It sounds, um, from what I understand, um, that that's from people within that sector. That's been a really useful change. I think the other thing to be mindful of is that uh, those 2030 plans that we're referring to are treated in various ways. Some of them have been more successful than the others. Ones that have been successful, particularly successful, have had that kind of step change in terms of how a sector sees itself and understands itself in relation in relation to the Australian public and in relation to themselves. And also uh, those that have some form of review and updating and an ongoing reference point, um, they, those plans have been able to secure allocations of funding with, at a federal level. Um, so I think there's some really useful things that we can learn from there. It's interesting, actually. Um, I think, you know, agriculture is another of these big 2030 reports that's in the mix. Um, now, they had a slightly different way of developing their plan in that the National Farmers Federation sort of came forth and said, you know, yeah, we want this plan. And then it um, moved to the Department of Agriculture, um, who really developed and implemented that. That's not the approach that you're um, preferring, I think, in the report, is that you're really saying an independent inquiry that has a deep engagement with the sector. Why is that? Is there a little bit of a limitation of the sector to lobby nationally um, in the same way that a National Farmers Federation does? Not that I'm saying that we should go down the road of becoming a National Farmers Federation. So I think each of the plans have been developed in different ways that reflect what the um, circumstances of that space are, what the, um, the effective organising mechanisms are. And certainly in the case of the National Farmers Federation, you've got a really well-developed industry group, membership-based industry group with um, a really long history of effective um, working together and, and identifying priorities that they can, they can work together on. And so for them, that was an effective mechanism for doing it. I think there is a urgency around this and the, of course, um, the COVID-19 pandemic is part of that urgency. But I also think uh, we have this little moment where all states and territories have a current strategy or plan or roadmap. The Australian Local Government Association have signed up all their members to a national policy position on arts and culture. This is a pretty incredible moment where we could have all three levels of government having a coherent policy approach to this area. And so I think the pragmatically using the current intel that has been gathered out of that parliamentary inquiry, out of those other types of consultation processes at different levels of government and drawing that together into a process is probably the most pragmatic and fastest pathway at this point. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Pra yeah, sweet think, um, pragmatism. <laughs> those those different levels of government. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting that discussion too, with the way the, the the report talks about some being the creators of venues and others being the people who are responsible for programming and things like that. So, you know, getting that collaboration um, is is uh, yeah is very important. I might just get some questions from um, the Great. audience that we've got. Um, Anne Robinson, Anne Robertson asks, um, what do you see as the next steps to progressing a national policy for those of us working in the arts? So in terms of progressing a national arts, culture and creativity plan, 
I think the next steps will be what we're looking at is the, the parliamentary inquiry report that will report sometime in the next few months. We are um, hoping that that will include a recommendation for the development of that plan. We think that if that was proposed, that the minister would be interested in that recommendation and that that would be the, the next steps of, of this progressing. However, that doesn't mean that we don't, um, we don't all have a role to play at this point. And we are certainly encouraging people to think about those questions that I popped up on the screen earlier, to have those conversations with, with your stakeholders and in your communities. What has changed? What do we think the purpose of public and private funding in this space is going forward? What do we think has changed um, in the 21st century, in the last 18 months? Pick your, pick your point of reference. So that we can get a running start on those types of questions with our stakeholders in our communities. Whether we, whether there's a, a commitment to a plan out of that parliamentary inquiry or, sorry, recommendation of a plan out of that inquiry, whether there's commitment to that um, out of, um, that comes from that recommendation, I think that there's a real clarity that some policy action in this space at a national level there's an appetite for. And so those conversations uh, are really useful to be having at the moment. Mm. Just to follow on to that, um, uh, Karen Weiss has asked a great question um, about who do you regard as stakeholders? You know, uh, have you considered the arts community groups and classes and, you know, the non-professionals as stakeholders as well? Absolutely. <laughs> so the, um, the broad um the, the broad set of stakeholders is absolutely key in terms of the arts and cultural sector, different, different types of participation, different types of involvement, as well as that even broader set of stakeholders that I referred to earlier of the three different levels of government, businesses, philanthropy, and the Australian public. This is, this is a broad approach in terms of the stakeholders, I think is, is really essential. And absolutely, the um, all different types of participation is relevant here. And it's sort of uh, you know it's 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 uh, familiar with sport as well, where a lot of you know sort of uh, amateur associations and you know are really the lifeblood of you know sport in those in twenty thirty plans and things like that. Um, mm. Just an observation from another audience member. Um, uh, in which uh, Stuart Coop uh, from uh, Creative Victoria has said, um, to work across jurisdictions, it makes sense to adopt the paradigm, um, the same paradigm. So perhaps use creative industries rather than um, just the arts or, you know, culture. And I think that that can sometimes be a bit of a problem um, in the sector that some people, you know, do like some words and don't like other words and, and adopting something, you know, that, that is common, you know, where we're collaborating on an idea that um, works together. Um, yeah, look, I think that's a really important point. And one of the things I would emphasise is um, recognising that state and territory governments as well as local governments do have their own positions on this. I think that um, this is not intended as a, you know, a national plan that would come down on top of those. Um, there will be different approaches in different places. And I think that uh, we can navigate those, those um, different approaches I think that is the nature of, of cross-jurisdictional work. Um, and But it, I think it is really important that we approach this with the idea that what works in one part of the country may not work in another part of the country and have um, be able to hold both that, that to be true, but also that there are things that we can work on nationally. Great. Okay. Um, I've got, we have lots of questions from the audience and I think we might try and just go a little bit after one. So if you're having lunch and you need a little bit extra time, you've got five more minutes, I think after this, we'll, we really want to get to as many questions as um, possible. Um, Marty Hurst asks, um, I've read the report and I'd like to comment on my feelings that it is skewed towards large institutions rather than small companies and sole traders. Um, I'm wondering, you know, and it's getting to that stakeholders question too, about how you would involve those people. Yeah, so just to reiterate um, how we would involve, we, we would not be developing those plans. Um, this is not a, a thing that we would be doing. Um, the, so I think that would be a question um, for most likely um, the Office for the Arts who would be um, developing this um, or, or certainly being the kind of lead in this process. 
um, what I imagine they um, would do, and I think um, they would be very aware of as, as we are, that there is a whole range of scale of activity here. There's a range of organisations as there are, um, as, as you say, huge national cultural institutions and sole traders um, in this space. And the examples that we really looked to um, when we were looking at that plan had that scope, had that span. Um, so I think there's absolutely an important um, breadth of stakeholders here. Great, thanks. Um, and Andy Miller asks, um, do we know if there are a state federal interest in forming a cultural minister's version of the national cabinet to establish a plan? Um, and I think one of the recommendations that, that the report makes is around uh, a twice yearly meeting of ministers, is that right? Yeah, look, I, with the, um, the meeting of cultural ministers, which had been that national forum between the different levels of government, um, was discontinued last year, along with a whole raft of other meetings. So I want to be really clear that it wasn't just that meeting. And certainly there's been interest and discussions around what type of, um, what kind, what kind of uh, mechanism might be appropriate. Uh, and, and we certainly are suggesting that if this type of um, plan was committed to that there would need to be both a, a collaboration at that level in its development but also in its implementation. My sense is that there is significant interest in that. Yep, great. Um, I'm wondering, um, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty probably is worth pointing out that, you know, uh, a new approach are an independent group. And I think, you know, possibly some of the questions coming through are about, you know, how will you uh, create a policy that works and things uh, like that as well. So um, I've just got a question from Mary Jo Caps who asks um, that the nirvana of, of, of uniting community funded and commercial arts has long been sought. Um, why do you think this has been so difficult to achieve? That is the magic question. Um, and I wish I had a magic answer. Um, my short answer is I think that there is a, um, it is true that this space is complex and it is true that this space is diverse. It is also true that many other sectors have those qualities as well. And I think that the, um, there is a shift and I'm hopeful that there is a shift in people being more willing to work in that way together. I do think that that, um, has, that space has shifted um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think also one of the really effective things that I've seen um, internationally is uh, places that have been able to describe how those um, different parts of the sector interact and how in fact many people move um, between them, that it's it's one and the same it's in terms of um, how how the talent and the skills work across there, that has been useful in some other spaces in understanding the the interconnectivity of those and the interdependence of those. Okay, great. Um, I've got a question uh, from Jody Mundy about another of a new approaches reports, the um, Middle Australians uh, piece of work, which I know has been picked up a lot by politicians and been used to um, look at funding. Um, Jody's just wondering, uh, you know, in referring to Middle Australians, she's just wondering why uh, that label is sort of applied to them, and is that because of the available research and data um, that that you found so far? So the one of the principles that we use when we are thinking about what research to do is really thinking about what we can uniquely do. And because we are independent of government, one of the things that we can do is take a quite targeted approach to some of that sentiment research. And in terms of that Middle Australia piece, we took a particular um, cohort, so middle-aged, middle-income swing voters in regional and uh, outer suburban locations, predominantly in marginal electorates. So there's lots of broad research that is demographically representative across Australia that takes demographically representative samples and looks at sentiment and participation. The ABA, the Australian Bureau of Statistics has a couple of um, really great um, data sets that they collect every few years. The Australia Council, of course, does the National Arts Participation Survey 
And so rather than duplicating those types of things, what can we we ask what can we uniquely do? And of course, I think we've all heard um, the idea that um, that arts and culture doesn't matter to politicians, that um, that it's not important to particular parts of um, Australian society. And that piece of work was going, okay, that's a claim that keeps coming up. Let's talk to that section of society that people are using in this in this very particular way and understand their perceptions. And we went into that work going, maybe they don't, maybe this particular cohort doesn't care about arts and culture. And if that's the case, we need to know it rather than just um, taking uh, people's opinions on that. And so that was really why we specifically decided to focus on that piece of work. Thanks. Okay, um, we've probably got time for one or two more questions. So we'll try, I'll try and cram in as many as I can. We've got a, we've got a record number of questions, I think. So <laughs> lots of interest in this subject, which is great. Um, Kian Sen Hu um, asks, what do you think is the greatest source of resistance, reticence, reservation, whatever you'd like to call it, to a coordination, coordinated national policy on the arts and culture across all levels of governments? What's the big blockers? I think that the, um, I think the big enablers, um, so I'm going to turn that question around slightly and say I think the things that will help make that happen is articulating what the benefit will be and making sure that that, like there is very important benefit there for the sector and that is an important thing. But there is also benefit for other stakeholders. And so making sure that we are, I think, that we will be enabling this conversation if we can talk about what the benefits will be more broadly to a broad range of the public. Okay, great. And look, finally, um, Carolyn Rogers, who I think was trying to send something through to our editor inbox earlier, I really want to just get her question if we can. Um, she's asked, the concept of mental health impact, generally speaking, and most definitely post COVID is covered in some health platforms. Um, do you feel that this is a viable point to include in the creation of, an, uh, of the new culture uh, we want to form for an arts policy? Yeah, look, I think uh, the... <laughs> The evidence is very um, strong around um, the important role that arts and culture plays in mental health. Um, so the, the kind of um, the objective evidence is strong, um, but also the subjective evidence. So what I mean by that is people believe that it to be true, as well as there are many different ways to demonstrate that it is true, that it has a fantastic positive impact. Of course, you know, there's there's negative impacts at time. It, it's not a... Um, it's not a fix all, but I think that it is one of the areas where there's really clearly an appetite for and good policy basis for, for a different conversation and inclusion of, of that as a priority. Great, thanks. Um, that's really all we've got time for. We've gone a little bit over time and Kate does have another meeting to get to. Um, so thanks very much for joining us, Kate Fielding. Um, Absolute pleasure and thank you everyone for joining and for the great questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for all of your questions. Um, we will get this video up as soon as we can. I'd like to thank everyone for their enthusiastic participation for giving us so many great questions. Um, we hope to get the video up later in this week. Our next video will be uh, towards the end of July and it will be uh, looking at how we can uh, monetize some of those digital experiences that we've been uh, getting up uh, in the COVID uh, pandemic environment. So. Uh, we hope to see you for the end of July, but until then, thanks very much, and we'll put, post the video very soon. Thanks, everyone.